Okay, this is about myocardial ischemia, infarction, and onto acute coronary syndrome. So really this condition is an imbalance of supply and demand of oxygen to the myocardium. Things that decrease supply or narrow coronary vessels, thrombus formation or vasospasm, dysrhythmias like the tachyarrhythmias we talked about. What increases demand to an excess is sudden um, increases in exercise, pain, stress, also tachyarrhythmias will increase the demand for oxygen. Hypertension is increased workload. Okay, so angina, there's different types of angina. So stable, prince metals, and silent. So stable angina is the one you can predict. Stable angina doesn't come on unless it's precipitated, like with um, exercise or walking. Okay, let's talk about prince metals. Prince metals is associated with vasospasm, so either with atherosclerosis or not. And then there's silent ischemia. And silent ischemia, we need to look at an EKG. Patients will complain of things, but it's so nonspecific. Fatigue, not feeling right, sometimes GI distress. And uh, women are at high risk for these silent ischemia MIs or silent angina, don't know why. Diabetics, we do know why. It's because the nerve fibers that are coming from the myocardium to the spinal cord have that uh, microvessel disease to the nerve endings. So diabetics won't experience that pain. Same thing with, or not the same reason, but same thing with cabbage patients is that because they've undergone that cardiac surgery, their nerves have been cut, so denerved. So why is the patient experiencing pain is because of anaerobic metabolism creating that lactic acid around the tissues and that's painful. So we need to ascertain from the patient what are they experiencing. We need to document this. So good old PQRST. What was the precipitating event? In other words, was an acute increase in exercise? What were you doing when this occurred? quality, describe this chest pain. Where does it begin? Is it the neck? Is it the jaw? Is it the left arm, the chest, the back? Exactly where it's located because depending on if the patient is having recurring chest pain, we can understand that if it's, in this, if it's displayed the same way that the vessels supplying the heart are going to be the same. So it's in the same location. Does it radiate anywhere, usually to the left arm? The severity, make sure you put it on a scale of 1 to 10 so we have an objective um, assessment finding of how severe that chest pain is. We don't want it to go down to a nice comfortable 2. We want that chest pain down to 0 because 0 means no myocardial ischemia. And the time, we want the time of onset so we know exactly how much time that this ischemia has been going on, helps guide treatment, it, do we have time to give those clot buster medications. Is the patient having diaphoresis? Is there pallor involved? Are they short of breath? Is there some dyspnea because of pulmonary congestion that could result from the heart being stressed? Nausea, so there is a reflex stimulation of the vomiting center and patients often have GI symptoms as well. EKG changes. Okay, let's take a look at some EKG changes that occur with myocardial ischemia. First there is ST segment depression T-wave inversion. So we talked about the whole complex of the EKG and the ST segment really is the repolarization phase. So when there is an incomplete occlusion, so ischemia, you're gonna see this ST segment going below that isoelectric line and the T-wave is going to be um, inverted. Whereas when there is a complete occlusion, when there is a transmural MI, you have something called ST segment elevation. So the ST segment is going to be way above this isoelectric line. It kind of looks like a fire hat all the way along. So also abbreviated as a STEMI or ST segment elevation MI. So now we're getting more serious in our conversation here. We're talking about MI, so angina that progresses all the way to infarction of that myocardial muscle. Aspirin, have a patient chew on aspirin if possible at the onset of chest pain, 325 milligrams. Uh, you want the you know the bigger dose, not the baby dose, and chew it. You want as uh, quick an onset as possible because that will um, debilitate the aggregation of the platelets, which sometimes is what is causing that thrombus formation. It's the initial reaction to the plaque that ruptures off 
you get platelet aggregation to that site. So this will halt the platelet aggregation to that site of that ruptured plaque formation. Oxygen, of course you want to increase supply of oxygen to the myocardium. Morphine and nitro, let's talk about them. They're both preload reducers. Morphine sulfate being a preload reducer because it will gently dilate those vessels going into the right atrium or being a venous vasodilator, that will decrease the demands for oxygen because there's less blood going into the right atrium. Also, it will induce this euphoric effect. It's an opioid analgesic, so it will provide that sense of comfort, but also when the patient's stressed, you're going to have a surge of catecholamines, which will increase the demands for oxygen. So morphine kind of targets that comfort, euphoria, life is good, even though it's not. But we want them to think it is. Nitroglycerin, okay, nitroglycerin being a nitrate medication will reduce preload by vasodilating that vessel going into the right atrium, so it will reduce demands for oxygen. Nitroglycerin will also cause a gentle coronary artery dilation, so that will increase the supply of oxygen to that ischemic myocardium. So nitroglycerin is definitely um, going to improve survival and you know it does result in a headache so you know you might want to treat the patient with some Tylenol let them know and just you know kind of look out for that let's talk about beta blockers so beta blockers do just that they block the effects on the beta receptor sites to the, the innervation of the sympathetic nervous system so in doing that you're going to decrease heart rate decrease contractility that's all really good for myocardial oxygen demand. It's all going to be kind of in a slowed state. So we, we want that now. We need to preserve the amount of oxygen in the system so it doesn't get more ischemic. So we call the beta blockers what's called cardioprotective because it is blocking those beta sites. And this is a circumstance where the patient's going to have surging catecholamines. They're going to be in a state of stress. So that's why a cardioprotective beta blocker is definitely on the docket. Let's talk about heparin. So heparin, we know, is the anticoagulant choice. So in this situation where we've got, you know, the plaque that's disrupted and then the platelets that get there first to aggregate, then comes the thrombus formation after that. So this is going to be that second line in um, preventing the clot from forming and completely occluding that vessel. So a heparin bolus and then a drip. Okay, all the while you want to make sure that you're drawing blood. You want to make sure you're getting cardiac markers. Troponin T is the most sensitive indicator for myocardial muscle damage. So the barometer or point where you know that infarction has occurred is 0.04 nanograms per milliliter. So in 99% of the population, if it exceeded this value, then an infarction occurred. CKMB, this isoenzyme or creatinine kinase isoenzyme, greater than 5% then an infarction has occurred. Some facilities don't even use that anymore, but it's good to have a whole slew of markers, even general nonspecific tests like white blood cells, a myoglobin, even though it's nonspecific, it will increase very readily after the infarct. So this way you have a panel and not to mention you want to draw all the other labs, CBC, you want to know about hemoglobin, oxygen carrying capacity, you want to make sure you know your APTT, the clotting time, you want to make sure you know the exact level of your electrolytes, are they normal in this patient that is getting compromised. So all the labs are important. Rest, what will rest do? Reduce demands for oxygen. Close the curtain, don't let stressful family members come in to see your patient. Stool softeners, why is that important? Well, because if the patient bears down, you know, to have a bowel movement, those vasovagal nerves are innervated from the brainstem, which is where the cardiorespiratory center is located, and actually can slow the heart rate through bearing down to have a bowel movement. So this is kind of stuff to keep in mind post-MI when the patient is at rest so you don't brady them down and have them, you know, fall over, have a syncopal episode. Bye. Uh -huh.